right. Well, it looks like they had a great time at Cause Week. I hope that your kids got to be a part of it. If they didn't, let me encourage you uh, to j- make sure that your kids get to be a part of it this next summer. Uh, it's something that we've been doing actually since the very earliest days of uh, being a church. Uh, our, our very, like, I, you know, we moved here one summer and the next summer we started the cause. We've been doing it ever since. And it's always a great time, real growth for the kids. But also, uh, you know, just the, the service in terms of the impact in the community is really significant. So speaking of kids, uh, so we have the, the little ones in here with us today. We're having a, a family service. Uh, uh, we are continuing to look for uh, the, the right person for our kids ministry, to lead our kids ministry. So if you would continue to pray with us uh, for that. Uh, for, for their sake. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just want to say to all the parents uh, with your kids in the room, like they're kids and they're going to be kids, so don't panic. All right? So if you need to get up and do something or move or whatever, like no one here, I'm certain of it because I'm saying this right now, no one here is going to judge you or look down on you. Um, you know, I grew up having, you know, being in the service as a kid. And uh, I actually preferred it as a kid. We had CCD, CCD and I could go. And I actually opted, asked. They even took me to the priest because they, had, they thought they needed to talk me out of it. And so I wanted to be in the service because I found that to be more interesting than uh, sitting in a classroom. So anyhow, uh, so I say to the kids, I'm glad to see you. And uh, please feel welcome this morning. All right. Well, so... Here we are, Romans chapter 9 today. You know, throughout this series, we've been, of course, talking about the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. And from day one, we've really, you know, tried to outline it in terms of, one, the old creation and the revelation of creation that brings to us to help us understand what is good, what is right before the Lord, how he created things, his intent in that creation, and then the problem of the fall, that how that has distorted things and put a gap between the intention of creation and who God is. And so what he is doing in those things is revealing to us his good nature, his kindness, his mercy, and yet it makes us aware of our desperate need for him and our need to be redeemed, our need for things to be put back into the right order. Chapters 5 through 8 explain this new creation, with chapter 8 being the epicenter, the apex of the letter, telling us of the heart cry of all creation, the entire cosmos, longing for the revelation of the sons of God and establishing what a new creation is to be like. Then, beginning with today in chapter 9, we begin to focus on the transformative process, that how God is working in these things to change it, So today we're going to pick up here in chapter 9 and we're focused on the whole thing that God has chosen us, not that we deserved it or that we are somehow deserving, but that he has chosen to rescue us despite having done nothing to deserve it. Not only that, but all of his works and wonders are also based not on our worthiness, our performance, our ability. God does not do these things because uh, we are better than someone or lesser than someone, but instead it is all about his kindness, all about his mercy, and all of his signs and wonders are done specifically uh, to be according to his plans and purposes which he planned long before In fact, so long before, it was even before the foundation of the world was laid to demonstrate, first and foremost, God's faithfulness, but also his great power and to fulfill those purposes, which include the invitation of the gospel to all the earth, which then ultimately includes you and I. With that said, let's jump into chapter 9 this moment. Morning, Romans chapter 9. If you're using a phone or tablet, please set those things to silent for the sake of those. Read from the English Standard Version. Please follow along in whatever translation you have. The one in your lap, of course, is my favorite translation because you're reading it this morning. Let's take a look. Romans 9, beginning in verse 1, and we read these words. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. 
My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had not done anything, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. For as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? What will what is molded say to the molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order that to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not only for the Jew but also for the Gentile, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, through the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. For as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That it is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. For as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word.
Well, if you were with us last week, you know we ended as we were reading through chapter 8 and, and deeply in the discussion about Paul saying there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It's a very famous text. It's one that we love to read to one another, uh, oftentimes leaving out you know, other parts around it uh, because we like that part. You know, we, we like the part, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. How about you? I like that too. I, I really like that part very much. But as we've pointed out time and time again, the reality is, is that the chapters that occur there you know, are things to help us find our place. They are not inspired. There are no inspired chapter breaks. There are no inspired verse numbers. Those are something that we added later on to help people find their place. Sometimes those chapter breaks came where they are simply because we ran out of scroll and went to another scroll. And so we called that chapter eight and we called that chapter nine because it was on a different vellum or a different papyra or whatever else that was being used to write. And so oftentimes those breaks make very little sense. Uh, we continue to perpetuate that today simply because if we started a new system, you know, somebody would say, well, are we in the, you know, the old system? Or are we in the new system? Are we are in the Baker publishing system or in the Zondervan publishing system? Because that's how you end up with all these different translations. Anyhow, is every publishing company wants to have their piece of the pie. Anyhow, well, nonetheless, I'm sure it's something for much more, you know, lofty reasons than that. But Building on that famous text there about nothing would separate us from the love of God, not height nor depth, not life nor death, nothing in all of creation can separate us. The sentence takes a turn and he heads into chapter 9 there and makes the point to us uh, that Paul is he's, he's looking at this whole thing that how nothing can separate us and yet he's telling us about a separation. Let that sink in for just a moment. The point being, nothing can pull us away from God. Nothing can take us away from God. But yet there is the issue of the matter of faith. That in other words, that this is not something that is established in us simply by being. It is not something that is established. It is not a universal salvation. We are not universalists. We do not believe, nor do we teach in the history of the Christian church. Have we ever taught, with very few exceptions, things we call today cults or we call that uh, new age or whatever else but in the grand scheme of teaching the whole historical interpretation of christianity has always believed that that we come to faith in christ and in the putting of our faith in christ that these things then are uh you know transferred to us then we are counted as righteous as we were talking about all the way building up now we've been building this whole point all along the way, we put a heavy emphasis on that in chapter 5, but it has been continually all the way building up to this point that one must be, have faith in order for that uh, to be counted to us as righteous, not simply just by our existing, not because we grew up and sat in church, not because uh, our parents were Christians, not because our grandparents were Christians or something like that, that it is in, entirely by faith. And now he is making the point that the same was true in Israel. The same was true in Israel. Oftentimes, from the, uh, if you did not grow up in Judaism, uh, first and foremost, uh, and you grew up in the church, there is sometimes a, a sense of misnomer that, well, all of Israel is Israel. In other words, we just assume that because someone was born of that descent that they belong to Israel. And in fact, Paul is saying here that not all of Israel is Israel. It does not make you ex post facto. Just because you were born into that lineage does not make you Israel. And you know, we can see some examples of that even now in modern Judaism. Uh, if we go to Israel, there are people... Uh, uh, quite a, a number of people who are ardently secular who live in Israel today. 
So their nationality, their uh, ethnicity is Israeli, and yet the reality is that many of them uh, have no connection to the faith any longer in any way. On the other hand, we have people who have adopted into Judaism who've, uh, you know, uh, maybe a part of Reformed Judaism, something like that, maybe by marriage, maybe by a faith conversion or whatever, and are a part of Israel today and that grander sense of that. When we come to this text, Paul is emphatically expressing his passion for greater Israel, all who were born as kinsmen according to the flesh. And he opens with these words of intercession on their behalf, saying that his, his heart is broken, his mind and his heart are burdened, if you will, for his cousins. That doesn't use the word cousins, but that's essentially what he's saying, is that I long that all my cousins, according to the flesh, all these relatives of mine who are of the different tribes of Israel, that all of them, uh, both uh, Jew and Samaritan, that I long for them to, uh, who are physical descendants of Abraham to know Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, as their Savior. But as it is, they have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And I would, if it would make, if it would make any difference at all, I would rather exchange my own place within the kingdom of God if it would rescue them all. If, they would, if it would keep them from being destroyed, this is his heart of intercession for them, that if there was any way, God, I would, that I would be able to exchange my place, that it would save the many. It is the heart of intercession, but it also it is the heart of Christianity, that in the very nature of Christianity, if the Spirit of God is within us, if the testimony of the Holy Spirit is within us, we should have this compelling sense that we are more concerned about those who are outside than we are concerned about ourselves, that there is this driving passion of one another that permeates the entire witness of the New Testament, that we could not that we could not look at someone else who is shut out of the gospel and it be okay with us. That it would never be a settling thing or a calming thing, or worse yet, that we could never wish that someone else would be cursed or anathema because we don't like them, because they've hurt our feelings, because they do things differently than I do. Because they broke my heart. It shouldn't be okay with us. The Spirit of God within us should cry out as it cries out in Paul, I would rather be accursed than them to perish. And if such a spirit were in the church today, I think that we would have the most amazing revival in, that we could ever imagine. Where that we would, instead of looking at our community and saying, man, it's all going to hell in a handbasket, that the cry of our hearts would be that they would know Christ and that we would put ourselves out. We would put ourselves into danger, into difficulty, into circumstances that are trying because we could not stand the thought that they are perishing if we, in fact, actually believe that they are. That's, I think, probably one of the greatest questions in the church today. Do we actually believe that people are perishing or is it just like... They're inconvenient, they're, we don't like them, or whatever. Uh, there, there is a, a real tension, I think, for the church today to ask it, ourselves the question, do we really believe that there, is a, 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 that there is hell? And that seems to be a big discussion in the church today. There's a lot of sectors in the church which are denying uh, the idea of hell. I think that is a destructive thing for the church. I think the end result is is why we are so uh, unevangelistic because if we don't think anyone's going to hell why inconvenience myself and two uh, we have a culture that says everybody's going to heaven 
And so, I mean, if you, you know, if you have just been out here to the Brooksville Cemetery, it's amazing. Do you know not a single bad person is buried in that, in that graveyard? Because everything, it talks about them going to heaven and mama was so great and wonderful and daddy was great and wonderful and there's just no criminals that have ever been buried out there. Did you know that? Nobody, there is not a single bad person. And, and if you listen to the news at night, there's no bad people that have ever killed anybody, right? Because somebody can go out and literally slaughter everybody and everybody will say, I just can't believe it. He was such a good boy. Well, if he was such a good boy, why did he walk into a school and murder a bunch of children? I mean, that is irrational, isn't it? It is irrational, isn't it? Am, am I the only one who thinks that's irrational? That, that everybody is a good boy. That everybody's fine. And so there is this real wake-up call, right, that in here that, that the reality is, is that, no, people are perishing. And even, even within Israel, there are people that are perishing. And so his heart and his mind is, is burdened by this. And he says, and here's the, the part that's the hardest, is this is true despite all of the benefits they had in the flesh. What benefits did they have in the flesh? Well, first of all, they had birthright as being children of Israel. They also had a proper upbringing in the sense of that they were educated, they were taught that if you, as you and I read through the Old Testament, we realize that all of their life was centered around the idea of that, that discipling their children so they would raise them up in such a way that they would know and do. And so they would do simple things, even in the terms of their traditions and all like that, but they would reach and they would touch the doorpost to remind themselves they had scripture there and they would touch the doorpost and remind themselves of who they were in Christ they would walk out they would all every meal had a plan of why they prayed the way they did it's not just simply to say thank you for the food it's to remember who is the source of where everything comes from. And so there was a, a regular prayer. Uh, sometimes uh, it sounds a little rote, uh, you know, but we're just say, you know, that uh, we thank the king of the universe uh, who brings forth bread from the earth. And in that prayer was just this simple reminder not to just simply thank God for the food, but it was this sense of that, uh, re discipling their children, discipling themselves over and over again. It's not a matter of convenience or inconvenience. It's not a matter of being religious or irreligious, as we might suppose when we invite people to pray or not to pray, or we just sit down in front of the TV and just go ahead and chow down. Uh, you know, uh, may, I don't know how it, it happens at your house, but the reality is, is that that was discipleship. When people ask me, like, you know, how do we get kids that grow up into adults? Because this is a, a common problem in the church today, right? Is that our kids are leaving the church in mass exodus as they graduate from high school. Well, most of them have no connection to the church anyhow. It's your church, not their church. Because we have continually secloistered them. I think one of the good things about sometimes having a family service like this is that our kids are learning about what we're about and that they might actually meet some adults and become friends with them so when they grow up they actually have some friends in church just a thought but we we segregate everything into uh, age appropriate because we don't want to be disturbed and and everything but listen discipleship doesn't just take place in that your kids would hear you know what the bible says about everything when you club them with it for not doing what you think they should have done hello it's not just that you and I pull out that verse conveniently to wrap them on the knuckles, so to speak, but where they hear that how we make decisions, that they actually would hear us pray, that, they would, that we would be mulling over Scripture and having those, con those conversations with them, uh, that we pray at the table not because uh, we're worried that somehow we're going to lose a blessing, but that we really want our children to know where everything comes from, that we don't believe that it's actually our paycheck. Because, can I just tell you, there's a lot of daddies out there who actually believe that the only reason their family has a good living is because of what they've done. And you may be conveying that to your children when you don't stop and pray and say, thank you, 
king of the universe who brings forth the bread of the earth. Like you're, you're making a statement about who provided. So I, I know I've gone to meddling. So. so that they have had this in their entire upbringing, these traditions that sometimes we mock. Tradition in the truest sense means the handing over from hand to hand. So a tradition can be good or it can be empty depending on how we use it. Do you have Christmas traditions? I bet you do. I bet you have Christmas traditions that you do it every year the same basic way as because you're trying to hand something to your children. I bet you have birthday traditions. We have lots of traditions. Don't confuse a tradition with bad. Ask the question, is it full of life or is it empty? And so they had this birthright. They had the proper upbringing. They had the education. And, he says, and they have favor. They have the favor of God. They are Israelites. And there is a sense of general blessing that is over them and where they have enjoyed favor. And, and so uh, sometimes we even uh, will talk about our, our nation as being a nation that has enjoyed a lot of favor. I think that's true. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, equate our nation with the nation of Israel. I don't mean that. I just simply mean that I think there's some reality that we recognize that we've enjoyed a lot of great favor in our nation. And so he says, listen, they have all these wonderful things, these, all these gifts, all these blessings, and yet it is they who have rejected the Messiah. It is not the Messiah who rejected them. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus not life, not death, not any of these other things. And yet he points out that some are perishing. Why? Because they have rejected Messiah. And he says that, so he's laying a, a clear understanding here that they have to make a decision. They have to accept it by faith. So those two thoughts are put, if you will, kind of juxtaposed to one another. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus and those who are Israelites according to the flesh perishing. Those who are Israelites according to the flesh are perishing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so those two things come into collision in our mind. If they don't, you just need to go back through and read it again because I promise you those two things are on a collision course. They don't make sense if I say to you, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then I turn around and say to you, there's some who should be are perishing. There is, those two things are incongruous. They don't seem to go together. Now they are put there on purpose so that we come to verse 6. Take a look down there at verse 6 in your Bibles. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Meaning that just as Abraham's blood flows through their veins does not mean that they share Abraham's faith. How many of you are fully aware that not everyone that grows up in your household gets the same message? Although you have given the same message to your children, uh, I, I recognize that in the case of my own, you know, with, uh, with, you know when you have uh, five of them, uh, they don't all respond to the message the same way. Part of it is their different personalities. Some of it is, is what things that they've heard, things that they encountered in life because you cannot shelter your kids no matter how hard you try from everything else that's going on in life or everything that happens in the, you know, on the radio, on TV, etc., etc., etc. So although Abraham's blood flows through their veins does not mean they share Abraham's faith. The best example I'm going to point to is not here in the text. I'll come back to that in just a moment. I want to help you get your head around this because the difference is, is that Paul was talking to Jews who grew up and knew these things primarily, and he's expecting that those Jews are going to tell those Greek Christians and fill in the dots, you know, in the blanks, wherever they don't know what the story is. 
So I'm just going to assume that I'm going to, like, I'm going to be a good Jewish older brother and explain the fill in the dots parts for you here if you are fill in the blanks part for you. So the best example that I know of is Ishmael. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn, flesh and blood. But he was not given this covenant of faith. He was given a blessing. He was given many things. But the reality is, is that he was not promised the inheritance. He was not given the birthright. Instead, he found himself uh, as not being part of the chosen. And so we have this whole understanding of Ishmael still today of the people uh, of the Middle East and how that there is, they are Semitic peoples. They are of the descendancy of Shemite through Abraham. And so they are a Shemite. They are Semite, as we would say in English. Uh, they, they are that lineage of people. And yet, they're not the chosen. Instead, it was the son of Sarah, Isaac, through whom the promise came, and with it, the faith of Abraham. Now, he goes into delineating what happens with the next generation, that there's two other born, and they are both Israelites. They are both of that right descendancy, and yet the younger one is chosen over the other one. And he says that, listen, this is not by human effort. It is not by your will. It is not by your strength. It is not by your goodness or anything else. And he is trying to make it very clear to them that it is not in all of the human effort that can put someone in a right place with the Lord, that it is by faith and faith alone. So, now we end up with this very sticky mess about grace and election that I'm going to unpack in just a few moments. But before I do, because it kind of gets tricky here, I want you to scroll your finger down to verse 24. Now, there in verse 24, it tells us that his mercy includes both Jew and Gentile because it is not in bloodlines, but in faith. Bloodlines were only the means by which he demonstrated his faithfulness and by which he provided Messiah. A Messiah who is Messiah to both Jew and to Gentile. A Messiah to the whole world. And so that we are demonstrating God's faithfulness. That's what you and I do as we're going through the Old Testament. We are tracking there from Genesis chapter 3 when he makes the promise to Eve that he, a male, will be of her seed and will be a blessing to the whole world. Although the serpent will strike his heel, he will crush his head. And there's that expectation, the preaching, the very first preaching of the gospel that runs all the way from Genesis to the book of Maps. It is there to draw us through and to understand that God is faithful, that He does exactly what He said He will do, and that all of time and history and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all these difficulties and the whole travail of the earth is not enough to stop God from achieving His plans throughout all time and history. He is able. He is not defied. He is not overcome by all the free choice of man. It is a great testimony. He is faithful. And he, through him, brought salvation to the entire world through Jesus the Messiah. And so there's this promise that even though these other things are happening and we can get kind of wrapped around the axle, especially as 21st century Americans who think everything has to be exactly the same in order to be fair. You ever do, you do that with your kids, right? Right, when you like, even like the, the ice cream, you know, you got to make sure it's like the same size cone and everything, or and they get everybody gets the same flavor and everything. I, I'm just telling you, I, you know, again, I'm going to go to meddling. I don't think you're doing your kids any favor. Life is not like that. I am not six foot seven and I can't dunk a basketball, okay? I, I just, I, I've tried really hard, trust me. I, I cannot dunk a basketball, it just, it's, I'm not built that way. And so, do I say that God was unfair or unkind to me? 
No, I, I'm grateful for who I am. I love the gifts and the makeup of who I am. I love my life. I don't look around at other people's uh, spouses and wish that I had that spouse. I'm grateful for the spouse that God gave me. See, there's this sense in which you and I uh, recognize that life is not the same for everybody. And then we have contentment. We have grateful for what God does in our life. He even gives us opportunities to pursue other things and to d discover and develop and, and all it's a wonderful thing, but here's the deal. At the end of the day, everything is not the same for anyone, not even two siblings. So Paul is making the point that even though it is not exactly the same, but by God's grace, he, he gives these things, he bestows upon them before they've ever done a single thing, before Esau and Jacob had ever done a single thing, God had made a choice. It says that before the foundations of the earth were poured in Ephesians chapter 1, that God purposed us in Christ Jesus. He had a plan. He worked it from the beginning. It had nothing to do with whether we were good or bad. He was working a plan. He made it work. He put all the things together. So then... He says, now comes the Messiah who, according to verse 33, has become a stumbling block to many, both Jew and Gentile. So he is the salvation to both Jew and Gentile. He is also the stumbling block to many. Uh, so the point is that he is salvation to those who believe. That's the primary point. If you believe, he's your salvation. If you do not, it doesn't matter your birthright. It doesn't matter how hard you work or anything else. That's not how you get it. Paul, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, however, didn't get to the point immediately. He meandered through a whole thing about election and God's right to pick and choose, which, like I said, is very offensive to 21st century readers. And so we have to go back and unpack those things. So verse 7, not all the children of the flesh are included, but only those who are children not by faith. And it is illustrated to us in the two brothers, Jacob and Esau, I also illustrated it to you in the contrast between Isaac and Ishmael that we, you know, that God makes choices and that is not an expression of a rejection. That is God planning all things out beforehand, but, he says, does not the creator of all things have the right to use what he has created to bring about circumstances and events and the unfolding of those things, does he not have that right also? And so the, the, what we're called to do is simply to recognize that God is working in things. He knows the beginning from the end. Uh, and so uh, he's also aware of what people are like and when they were created and how they're going to react to things in ways that you and I do not recognize even in our own children. And so we we see tendencies. I can tell you that I saw a number of the things about what my children are like when they were little. Both their strengths and their weaknesses. Often, I recognize that the weaknesses in them, I could look in the mirror and find in me. Hello? Anybody here ever see your weaknesses in your children? Anybody here ever see your strengths in your children and went, woohoo, I got, got them something good. Hello? So, <clears throat> when we come to this, it's telling us that, um, you know, uh, that this favor of God was not based on actions, therefore works, but the favor of God is something that he has, he, one, he in choosing them was performing his will and getting it done. And two, that the grand favor of God, the, the invitation to the gospel coming through that promise was then extended to everyone who would accept it by faith. But the reality is, is that some do not accept. So verses 14 to 18 tells us that God did not choose Isaac based on his works. God chose Isaac before he was born, nor did he reject anyone based on their works, but promised that, that there would be an heir. God did not reject Pharaoh based on his works, 
but chose Pharaoh before he was ever born, which is articulated that Pharaoh, you know, which is not articulated, is that Pharaoh could have chosen not to play hardball. God knew his heart, knew his re response and his reaction to those things, but the reality was is that God, he was, choices were laid before him and he made choices. The same is true of Judas. Judas made choices. You may not like the idea that God has like, chosen someone to fulfill a role, but the reality is, is God knows who they are, how they were made up, how they were put together. He knows how they're going to respond to those things. You and I, when we are dealing with our children, do not know how they're going to always respond to things. But oftentimes we do know, and we do it anyhow, don't we? Yes. Yes, we do. In this particular case, he knew how Pharaoh would play and he just he continually made those decisions over and over again and which it says that God hardened his heart. It does not mean that God sat out to pick on him or anything else. He knows who he is. What softens one heart hardens another. God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. How we respond to the falling of the rain is on us. How we respond to drought is on us. How you respond to the favor of God is on you. It could be a test. There are people who have walked in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit and still made it all about themselves. Hello? Sometimes the favor of God is a test. When you are put into a places of great honor, sometimes that might be the test. You thought it was because you were so awesome. Hello? Anybody here ever been put in a place of great honor and realized that it was the test? It didn't mean that you were able or capable. It meant that this was an opportunity to humble yourself in the power and the presence of God and let Him work through you. But if you thought that you got to that position because you were so awesome, the likelihood that you're going to do something stupid now after having received the favor of God is increasingly exponential. Hello? You don't think anybody's ever become president of the United States only to find out that it wasn't a blessing? Anybody here? Okay, so my point being, God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, and you and I have a tendency to look over there and go, oh man, the grass is greener on the other side. Is it? Is it? This is the whole thing of that God chooses people and puts them in places to do what he has for them to do. It does not necessarily mean that it would be the best thing for you. And so you and I find our contentment in this idea that God who is all-knowing and wise and his decisions and everything else, that he has put you and I in this position to be who we are in this time, in this place, and to walk in the power of the Spirit and to be transformed people and to be used for the power of the gospel to extend grace and mercy and hope and healing to the people around us, maybe even to the very ends of the earth or whatever the calling is that's upon your life and you have the opportunity to either fulfill it or to reject it. But here's the thing is that it is only by faith in which you are saved. Not because you are so awesome. Not because you are so awesome. But here's also the thing. God rescues those whom he owes nothing. See, if it was based on your good works, that means that he rescues you. Well, did he rescue you? I mean, he just, I guess, he rescued you, but he owed it to you? No, and all the people of the earth, all the people of the earth have the invitation to become sons of God, thus giving the promise made to Abraham away, verse 30, even to the Gentiles. That's the point of verse 30. Who had never pursued righteousness. In other words, he's talking about the majority of people in this room. 
He did not save you. He did not offer the invitation of salvation to you because of your inheritance. He didn't offer it to you because of your lineage or anything else. He offered it to you simply because of his goodness, his kindness, his mercy, and his grace. And so he owes you nothing. He owes the Jew nothing. He owes the Gentile nothing. He owes you nothing. He owes your grandma nothing. He owes your mama and daddy nothing. Even as they laud, the, you know, they rail again uh, to heaven and go, oh God, that my children would know you they would walk with you all the days of their life that is our hope that's our desire for all of our children and yet the reality is is God owes you nothing he doesn't owe you favor he owes you nothing but he loves the whole world he loves the whole world. And so this becomes a major stumbling block right at that moment. Because just like the Jew who thinks then that I should be saved because I'm a child of Israel and because I have all of these things and I've learned all these things and who work through all these things and he says, I, I, I should be blessed. Do you know there are church people who think they should be saved also because of their good works? Do you know there are church people who think that that because they tithe that they ought to be given a higher position at work and never ought to suffer difficulty or hardship. Did you know that there are Christians who think that they should never have hardship, trials, or suffer? I've even heard it taught on TV. Have you? That if you just tithe the right amount, if you just are, are, are holy and you do all the right things and you don't cheat on your taxes and you don't cheat on your wife and, you, you know, and all those kind of things, that somehow you are entitled to something? Anyone here believe that? Don't raise your hand. Me too. I can remember planting a church in Muskegon, Michigan, and when my youngest son had congenital heart failure, and they were going to have to rip his chest open at 10 months old, and I, my, my first response was, but God, we're planting a church. You know, that didn't seem to make a difference at all. Because it is not by my works. I was saved by mercy and grace just like everyone else in this room gets saved. He saves us because he loves us. It does not exempt us from difficulty, trial, and hardship. What we've been saying for the last eight chapters. So the stumbling block is this. Jesus is the stumbling block. He's the stumbling block if you're a Jew. He's the stumbling block if you're a Gentile because the reality is, is that you realize that God chose us and demonstrated his power and also he demonstrates his wrath and that it has nothing to do with our good ability to rescue ourselves. It's not because we deserve it, but it is simply by faith alone. And you and I have to let that sink in deeply because if we don't, we end up with a kind of wonky, put-together Christianity that looks a whole lot like religion. Amen or oh me? All right, we need to wrap up. So uh, listen, um, believe it or not, that is really important to you and I understanding what it means to be a new creation. Because as we elaborate on this, on our part to play in the whole role of transformation, one of the things that happens over and over again, when we start talking about these things, is we're moving towards Romans chapter 12, and it says that you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it's calling on you and I to do those things so that you and I can know and do His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The more as we build this up toward what it looks like as, as the transformative power of Christ is at work within us, it's calling us to activity. It's calling us to do things. And so sometimes people get those two things mixed up so somehow they think that they're becoming more saved along the process or something like that and that's not what we're talking about on the other hand when it isn't happening there is the good question that we want to ask ourselves like if I'm not having fruit if this is not if the transformative power is, is not 
is not at work in me, if when I press into these things, I'm not seeing any fruit in these things, it does make me want to ask the question. It does beg the question, do I know him? Is his power at work within me, right? And so there's that, that tension there that we're going to work through. So it's really important that you and I get this part that salvation is not by works. Salvation is not by your grand effort. Favor of God is not by your grand effort. Whether you suffer or do not suffer is not because of your grand effort or your ability, but that you and I then would experience more of his power at work in us as we press in, we could easily get those things confused and we could accidentally disciple people into an atmosphere to which we are telling them, well, if you're not doing X, Y, and Z, you're not, a, you're not a Christian. And they might get the idea that what we mean by that is they need to do those things to become a Christian. We're not saying you do those things to become a Christian. We're saying that if the Spirit of God is at work within you, if you are being transformed, that these things then are been enabled and you should be able to do them by the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. And then that's where you and I need to press in so that we can experience more of what he is doing in us. So all of that said, uh, I just want you to know, uh, you know you, you will, you're, you're, you're not going to go to heaven and you're not going to go to hell based on uh, all of the things that you do. Uh, you uh, are in that position by faith and faith alone. And so if we love God and we love his ways, then his power works within us to transform us. All right. Well... Hopefully you see where I'm going with those things. Let's do a little ministry time before we wrap up this morning uh, because we're already over and I need to, to do that. So, uh, uh, but you know what? We don't, have, we don't have to get people out of kids' church this morning, so we've got a little time. So I have three things for ministry time, and none of these are tied directly to the message. I was, I was kind of like, really, God? You know, like, you're not going to... I did all that preaching, and now we're not even going to use it. Okay, so... Um, uh, here are three things that I just feel like the Lord has put on my heart this morning. If you are here and you are having some shoulder pain, if you're having shoulder pain, could be chronic shoulder pain, could be something recent, I just want to invite you to, to just stand for some prayer this morning. Shoulder pain. If you are here this morning and you are struggling with anxiety, all right, <laughs> that's so honest. I, I, I heard the, Psh. yeah, all right. So uh, anybody struggling with anxiety this morning, and it could, be, it could be the chronic kind, it could be, you know, more event-related, but I see a couple of people standing up. And then the last thing, if there's anyone here this morning and uh, you are having issues with sciatica, you're just nerve pain, shooting down your leg, making it hard to uh, stand, so Gary's going to get both. Uh, this morning, so uh, we, we, he needs some patching up. So, um, uh, all right. Anybody else? Shoulder pain, anxiety, sciatica. All right, let's do this then. Let me invite you, take a look around you. Find somebody that is standing in need of prayer, and let me invite you to go over to them. Uh, I, you want to ask before you lay hands on them, but we, we believe in the laying on of hands. But ask, make sure that you know, you're not doing anything offensive. Uh, and, uh, and would you just take a moment and let's go to them and let's pray for them. So Holy Spirit of God, we just invite you. Lord, we know that you are here with us and among us. But Lord, we're asking for your power and presence right now confident that your presence is your power that we're not asking for something we are asking for someone and so holy spirit would you come and minister in the name of jesus right now come come lord
And while they're praying, if we have some prayer team members that are available, if you go ahead and come on up. If you're praying with somebody right now, go ahead and just keep doing that. But So if you are in need of prayer for any other reason, you know, that we didn't list there, the, you know, or even maybe you thought about it afterwards and you wish you had gone up, uh, let me invite you. There are prayer team members up here would be glad to pray with you about that or anything else. Could be something about the message, could be about something going on in your life, separate and apart from that, financial, health-wise, or whatever. And uh, let me encourage you to come get some prayer this morning. Otherwise, let's, let's pray, and uh, after we pray, if you are, w- want to visit, and I would encourage you to visit and talk with people, let me encourage you to do that in the lobby. Let's leave this area for prayer, if you will, please, and uh, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your kindness and your mercy. Thank you for what you're doing in us, through us, around us. And Lord, we're asking that you would continue to stir our hearts with great passion for the things that are on your heart. That we would have great passion for the nations, Lord. That for every ethnicity under heaven, for all our from our neighbor next door um, to uh, people in uh, the grocery line, wherever we find ourselves, in which we are among those who do not know you as their Lord and Savior. Uh, Lord, we're praying that you would stir us up with compassion. We're praying that you would stir us up with a holy boldness, that we could be your hands and feet in our community. And so, Lord, that you would send us forth to do your good, pleasing, and perfect will. Lord, we're praying this morning that you would give us clarity in our understanding, that you would bring to recollection the things that we need to share, Lord, we pray that you would continue to build us as the body of Christ in our love for one another. Laying down our offenses, laying down the things that are are standing in the way of unity. uh, Believing that you have commanded unity is your expectation that, that we would be unified, that we would belong to one another, and that that is not optional. And so we're asking you to stir that up within us. In the mighty name of Jesus. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you next week. Please continue praying for us to find the right person to lead our children's ministry. And I hope to see you next week. God bless. We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit vinelife.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook and Instagram. God bless you as you love God, love people, and pass it on. We'll see you next week. We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit vinelife.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook and Instagram. God bless you as you love God, love people, and pass it on. We'll see you next week.